Wagwan. What's Wagwan, up, bro? Wagwan, brother. Yeah, they love me over here. I was telling you that yesterday. They love me over here. I'm 100% about to be back for sure. I want to do a summer. Yeah. Like, I want to do that. I want to do like a whole summer out here if I can. What, which part of London do you think you would stay in? I don't know. Of and th- that's the thing, bro. Like, I've been bouncing around. Like I said, I spent my first two days in West London, the second two days in like Central South London, and then these last two days in East London. And I like, I like South London a lot more, but it's not as nice. It's not as nice. The um, East London, there's a lot of like Middle Eastern people over here. And there's a lot of like, I don't know, there's a lot of shops over here where like the writing is not in English. And it's a little bit rougher over here. I'm not going to lie. Like last night when I was leaving the club, I missed the last train. So I had to walk back. And I was walking, like, I was telling my friend, like, it looked like, like how Top Boy, like when they be out there serving food, that's how I look, right? And I was walking grimy. fast. Yeah, bro, I was walking so <laughs> fast. I was like, I might have to start running real shit. I was like, I might have to start running because we in a rough ass part of town. But London is so big, bro. I didn't even get to see it all. But at this point, I'm just kind of tired, bro. I totaled up how many miles I walked. I walked 48 miles on this trip. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to get the trip cut a day early, but it I just had books shit to, through Tuesday, so I couldn't do it. But we'll be back tomorrow. It was a great trip. I will say that this is what I mean. That it was everything I thought it would be. The vlog is coming out soon. That will be on the page within... I won't give it a date because it's going to take me a minute to edit. But there will be a vlog, lots of content coming for you guys. This is episode 20 of the Rhythm and Runners podcast. We fucking made it. We fucking made it. You know what I'm saying? Two zero. Two Yo, zero. Y'all, you can ne- y'all niggas can never, never make it to 20. We made it to 20. Even across the country. Across, across the world, not across the country. We've been doing it across the country. Across the world, nigga, we here. You know what I'm saying? Talking about shit. How's it going? How's Florida? How are you enjoying it? Uh, pretty good. I'm just getting used to the heat. I've been kind of repacking stuff, trying to get my HBCU to contact me back. Hey, if you're going to an HBCU, start talking to your school in August, because if not, they might not give you your credits and they might not answer the phone. So definitely start doing that. But I've definitely been enjoying it, kind of just getting ready for school. I move in on Wednesday, so exciting time, but I'm good. How about you, London? I mean, you already I- kind of talked about it, but... I saw you said that that the basketball coach was responding to your emails, but financial aid wasn't. That's kind of insane. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I've I've emailed financial aid. And it took them at least, like, two weeks to hit me back. Like, that was before. I hit the coach while I was sitting in um the rel- this Relish Burger place in Jacksonville, and he hit me back within 20 minutes. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense that, like, this guy can answer, but the people who I'm, I'm trying to give you money, like I'm saying, y'all trying to take money yeah, from me, yeah. and y'all still can't answer the phone. Like it's it's crazy to me. It doesn't make any sense. Like, have Have you still been like working out, like staying in the gym and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, obviously at the Y I was going to back home, there's always a lot of kids in there. It was summertime, so it's hard to get in the gym. And then like going all the way back up to the community college I was going to, I was not trying to put 16 miles on my car every single day, going back and forth, like both ways so i wasn't really in it like that but i would definitely say i've been working out at least 30 to 40 minutes a day in the gym and then lifting i've been getting that in every day for sure at least five six days a week but i think if anything i would love to even do media with them like i was thinking about if i didn't make the team or what i would do if i wanted to stay around the team and i think doing their media doing camera work maybe like editing if they have that and then still working out seeing if i can make it even the next year because i mean it's not impossible in my eyes and i definitely think it's something i could do because i mean they brought on three walk-ons last year all guard positions so i feel like it's not an impossible feat with the right work and seeing what their program is really about so yeah that's yeah. like that's the double-edged sword with HBCUs that I noticed when I was trying to look in and apply was that um, the turnover is so high. Like, the turnover on the teams is so high. The turnover on the coaching staffs is so high. And that could play into your favor if you're trying to get on the team, but also, like, yo, like, it gets kind of crazy. So 
It'll be interesting to see what happens with that, though. Yeah, I'm just kind of hoping and hoping and waiting, hoping and waiting. So I wanted to start off with Cardi B's new album. I did not know this was a report. Where did you see this? What happened? I saw that Cardi B had said she was releasing her new album very soon. I was more so just excited to see like what was going to come from it because we do see a kind of shift in rap music and know that Cardi B has that Spanish influence on her. Like one of her biggest songs was I Like It that had Bad Bunny on it. And she was on there kind of getting into her Spanish bag. And let me just read. It said Cardi B's second album is almost ready and set to be released soon. The 30 year old is gearing up to drop a follow up to her 2018 debut studio album, Invasion of Privacy. And she's expected to release a lead single from this record in September. And something else I saw in the article was just that she was talking about how much money and time she put into just even the single. And I think that she's taking a long time off. So kind of like these other artists who take a long time off, the bigger artists, we're going to get a really good project out of her. And she recently released a song with Offset. And I thought Offset on that song went absolutely crazy. Like his flow was nuts. But her verse on that song was also very good so i'm excited to hear what she does with it if she incorporates some spanish artists in there maybe some spanish features or even like her beat selection might be a little different so excited to see do you compare like do you put cardi b in like mc rapper conversations like like go conversations i mean maybe within the female part of the genre I don't, I don't know if that sounds weird, but I feel like if you measure her up to a lot of the female artists that are coming out, she's a lot better of a rapper than what you hear from some people. So I could definitely say she's one of those MCs, but I also feel like she's a figure. Like, I feel like rap was kind of like a stepping stone for her to get into stuff like beauty and fashion and like all the other stuff. And like, even I know a couple years ago, she did something with like Baby Shark with her offsetting her kid. So like, getting her back into TV. Like, I feel like she's always been this big personality and that kind of, at the end of the day, music is entertainment. So if you got this figure that can draw a lot of people in and she's also not that bad of a rapper, her voice doesn't sound bad over the beats you pick for. I feel like I could put her in that conversation in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about it was it was a Joe Budden million dollar it was actually yesterday, it was a Joe Budden million dollars worth the game interview. Um it was really bad. Don't go watch that. But uh, it was so bad. I'll talk to you about it off air. But it basically they asked him like who he likes in rap. And he started naming people that weren't necessarily like the best rappers or the best lyricists. And I thought it was interesting because when they asked him, they were like, yo, we were just looking for like who's spitting the best or who rapping the best. And his retort to that was interesting because he was like, that doesn't matter. It isn't that important in terms of who's the best rapper. Because he was like, I had, he was like, I felt like I was, I had one of the best parents in hip hop when I was rapping. I was one of the best lyricists when I was out and I didn't, I didn't make any waves. Like that had nothing to do with, like I didn't move the needle at all. And when he said it like that, and then he brought up the people that he liked, like a Vince Staples or some other people, I was like, oh, I see what he's saying. And then it's like, it sort of makes me think about like the greatest of all time conversations differently, right? Like, like when we always talk about the greatest of all times, we say Jay-Z is the greatest of all time a lot. And it's not necessarily completely based on his lyrics or his raps. You know what I'm saying? When people talk about Jay-Z as one of the greatest rappers of all time, they often talk about like the things he did outside of actually rapping. And that had me like rethinking like the entire way that we quantify an artist in that way. Right. We always say Nikki is one of the greatest of all times, partially because of her lyrics, but she was one of the highest selling female rappers or rappers of all time. You know what I mean? And the success that Cardi B had on her album. It's like, if you're measuring things and quantifying things by that, and she follows this album up with a high selling album or a, a popular album, then I feel like in those types of conversations, you do have to mention her a lot more than you do previously. When I would think of the conversations, I was thinking of it the other way, like lyrically. And I would never put Cardi B in that conversation lyrically with other people like that. And so now that I'm thinking about it a little bit differently, I guess you got to put some more respect on her name 
especially this album as well. Yeah, I think a lot of rap music is that ability to not only have good lyrics, but have it sound good as well. And I think that's one of the knocks that I said all the time. Nas had that knock for so long that it was just like, you can rap well, but you pick trash beats. So I feel like flows, your beat selection, just how everything sounds around what you're saying is way more important than people would give it credit for. And I think in the past, at least 10 years probably, is where it became really important with people who are making less lyrical rap. So I feel like at this point in time, for sure, it's a, that, that's definitely a thing. And, and marketability too. Transitioning into the next topic that we wanted to talk about, this Ebro tweet that he put out a couple of days ago, which I thought was really interesting, especially with me being out of the country. I feel like I have a lot of different insights on this now. Like he tweeted the other day and Ebro is, he's at Hot 97, he's a DJ over there. And he's also the head of editorial at Apple Music for hip hop and R&B. And so he got, he put a tweet out saying, I got a call saying, it should be noted that major labels, major record labels have deprioritized signing rappers. The focus is now African music and Latin music. Rappers better stop being boring and talking about the same stuff over and over, chasing TikTok success and comment sections. Now, I have some thoughts on the actual, what the labels are saying, but being outside of the country and like going to, especially not even the festival, like the festival, you're going to hear the artists that are there and the music that they put out, right? That's just a given. But being at that show last night, like, I got asked so many times, and we talked about this a little bit on the phone, but I got asked so many times, where are you from, right? And when I would say America, and then they would be like, I would say Chicago, and they'd be like, no, where are you from? Like, that's a regular occurrence among Black people out here, like, where they ask where you're from. And it was so crazy. Like, I was at the toilet, and I was peeing, and this dude asked me that. And when I said, like, I didn't have, like I'm like, I'm Black American, like, that's it. Like he started talking to a dude he didn't even know next to him. He was like, bro, that's so crazy. He was like, they don't know where they're actually from. It seemed like a lot of, and being in places like this, you realize like how much relatability there is among like different black communities that aren't black American. And it's interesting in that way. Cause like when the music comes on, like they have a, an appreciation for each other's music that I don't feel like we have for them. You know, and I think that that has been something that has circulated the music in a different way. Like, expect, even with the Latin music, right? Like, Bad Bunny is Puerto Rican, but he's he's killing in America because there's a bunch of Mexican Americans there, there's a bunch of Puerto Ricans there, there's a bunch of Cubans there. You got him killing through Central America and South America, right? Like, they have an appreciation for each other's like music and native tongue that Black Americans don't have. Like, when I was at Starzy, they were like, "Yo, Starzy's really big over there, isn't he?" Like in America, right? And I'm like, bro, none of my friends listen to Starzy. Nobody I know listens to Starzy. And they're all surprised because at that concert, everybody was singing everything word for word. And I think that that has a way of creating not virality, but it makes songs a lot more popular than I feel like, than you would expect them to. And I think we're at the point now where streaming and the internet has caught up with a lot of the other parts of the world and the labels have noticed that. And rap has sort of cornered itself. A lot of rap has sort of cornered itself in this like really repetitive, like they're sort of putting the same thing out. You know what I'm saying? Like the drill, the, the content that they're talking about has sort of like put them in a smaller box. A lot of, not all of rap, I'm not trying to single everybody out, but a lot of rap is like that now. And I feel like that's what the labels are seeing now. Like I, I saw, like everybody knew Taliban's last night. I was surrounded by majority African, African descendants or African immigrants, but everybody knew Taliban last night, you know? And I think that that is an interesting place that we are in music. And it's like, we have, we are sort of, and we've always kind of been the other, which has been interesting, the black Americans, like we've kind of been the other group as in just the diaspora. But I think now that the labels are deprioritizing like American rap, it's just an interesting place to be in, you know what I mean? Especially being overseas and seeing what it do over here. Like, obviously, rap songs still ring off. Like, I was listening to Sexy Red last night, which is fucking nuts. Like, like that's crazy. But I think it 
definitely was interesting to see him say that, but I think it was something me and you already knew. Yeah, and I think one thing I really took from it, like I was listening to that Black Sheriff, a little two-pack he dropped last week. I didn't get to hear it before. And then I heard some, they were, I think they're, I want to say they're uh, Nigerian, but I don't want to say that. Some podcasters I saw just talking about how he was a drill superstar or he was becoming one or something like that. And I just thought it was interesting because I feel like it, those genres of music are going to blow and they're going to keep blowing and they're probably going to be the most, the biggest for the next five to 10. But I do feel like there's still a lot of influence that comes from rap and just the black genres and the stuff that comes from over here because of the fact that that's what's been the biggest for a while. So I feel like we're still going to see some of those types of things pop up in African music and Latin music. Like, I feel like we even still like, I remember I sent you that Anuel song where he sampled, um, uh, it was Mob Deep. It was Mob Deep, right? And I feel like at the end of the day, rap itself is this innovative genre. It's a new, it was always, it's always been a new thing and it's been this like thing that shook up the industry. So I feel like it's still going to play a part into that. I definitely still feel like rap is still going to be. You're right. And I, and, and I think, and I've been going back and forth with people on Twitter and some people think I'm like, I don't know. It's interesting because I'm so adamant about the other types of music now that some people think like, bro, you don't even listen to like black American music, which I think is funny and interesting, but this is like broader than music because we are disconnected from everybody else. We have been in this constant state of innovation over here. This constant state of separated innovation where it's like, it's like, because we don't have a connection with Africa in that way, like we are constantly just pulling from like our own experiences. You know what I'm saying? Like we're independent in that way. Like we have flaws and there are problems with some of the way we, we the ways we do things over here. But that Fela Kuti tweet that I, uh, I mean, the interview that I quoted a couple episodes ago, I think that just says a lot about just the black American experience. It's like, we're so disconnected that a lot of us were just like stumbling and trying to figure it out. And we built a lot off of that. And you 100% have to credit, like if you look at a lot of these artists that are out here blowing up, they have taken influence from people over here and they have said it. And it's not like surprising, you know what I mean? Like Bad Bunny has talked about how much Drake influenced him. You know what I mean? Burner Boy has talked about how much, how much like DMX influenced him or how much Naughty by Nature influenced him. You know what I mean? How Central C talks about um, you know what I mean? Like these artists that are blowing up in other parts of the world have given credit to those influences from over here. And I don't think that's like, I think we just have to look at it differently. It has to be like, okay, we have to find a way to sort of create, like we have to create the connection, like the bridge, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have yeah. to be us versus them. We've been influencing them and now maybe we need to take in. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? You know, yeah, I just think sense. we just we just have kind of like it's always been this diaspora thing where it's us versus them. We're like, we don't really connect in that way. And it's like, no, like now that we're all connected via the Internet and we had time to get acclimated, I like, know maybe we should all take a page out of each other's book, you know, and then my tweet under this was like. It just tells me A&Rs and the people at these labels are just so out of touch because it shouldn't be or. It should be and, right? Like, they definitely should focus more on African music and Latin music because it's good. But that doesn't mean, like, just discount, deprioritize signing rappers. If the rapper is good and has, like, potential, then you should sign them. I think just they want to sign, like, finished products. They don't want to develop artists anymore. And a lot of rap has been, like, like and, and the crazy part is, like, reading this, like, it says they're chasing TikTok success and comment section. It's like, who do you think is telling the rappers to do that? Their managers, their A&Rs, the labels are telling them to do that and it's not working and they're like, forget it. And so I have, I've been doing a lot of writing on the fact that the name of the video is going to be hit, uh, major labels destroyed hip hop and African music and Latin music are next. They destroyed, they did that, you know what I mean? And so yeah. it's definitely just like, Reading that tweet had me thinking about so many different things. And I think like the next 10 years are going to be really interesting, you know? 
Yeah, and I think if labels sat there and instead of just signing a bunch of artists that they thought were going to pop because they had one or two songs go, if they signed artists, not even finished product, but artists they were willing to sit there and put real time and development into, you would see way better artists come out of it. You would see way better quality of songs come out of it. And that's why before the TDE blueprint, we could go back to that. The TDE blueprint was working. Like you sat there, they developed SZA, they developed Kendrick, they developed the J-Rock. They, they developed these people instead of just sitting there, oh, just make a quick one, make a quick one. And I don't know. I don't know. Before, you could do it, but they're not doing that now. Well, we'll see what happens with that. You know, we've already been on this African music and Latin music wave. So I think we'll definitely just be keeping an eye on that and stuff like that and see what happens. But um, I want to get into Burner Boy. I want to get into Burner Boy briefly, but I don't want to take too long on it because I have some thoughts on where this album is going. But this, like the, he is, he is patient zero. With this, like to this tweet, he is patient zero. His album comes out next, uh, on Friday. He's having the album release party on tomorrow on tuesday in tallahassee well not in just in tallahassee but if you look at the locations where he's doing the album listening party like they're all american dates he had global dates like i just somebody had just asked me to go to the burner boy listen the burner boy release party on saturday i'm not gonna be here but there's a release party out here in london on saturday we had stuff in lagos but if you notice they're making a concerted effort to really put him out there in american markets like, that's what this is. Like, I've never seen an artist, like, having global listening, like, listening parties across the country at multiple locations in multiple markets in multiple states. Like, they're trying to make a concerted effort to make him, like, more American. His, they're trying to make him more marketable in America, right? Like, people, I, we talked about how Joey Atkins said he wasn't making Nigerian music or making music for Nigerians anymore. And when I saw the the clip, the snippet that you talked about before we started, he was wearing the Wu Tang hat. He's sampling the Jeremiah song, right? Like, I agree with him now. I agree with what Joey Atkin was saying, and it's not a bad thing, you know. I think the goal, like, he's not speaking to. It's not that he's not speaking to Nigerian artists. He's focused on speaking to Americans right now. He's trying to capture a new market. And he's using the aesthetic, he's using the samples, he's using the features to do it. You know what I mean? This is just a phase in his career. You know what I mean? He's just focused on this because he's focused on becoming a global phenomenon, even more than he already is by taking on the number one market. And I just thought it was so interesting because I'm like, bro, the song is fire. I fuck with the song. I fuck with the music. But when I was like, yo, he was right. He was right. Like, I just had to look at it from a different perspective. And I think that It'll be interesting to see how this album does in America. You know, I think it's going to it's going to do what it does. But if Americans respond well to it, then we're just going to see. And that might be where it fucks up. Like when they start just putting Wu-Tang hats on every African Latin artist. Like, it's like that's going to be crazy. So this is like really definitely patient zero with this. I told them out. So. Yeah, I feel like when I saw the snippet. I was kind of like iffy about it. Like, in my opinion, one of the knocks I have on current American rap music is just the fact that they keep overusing the samples. There's like no new sound. It's like, if I wanted to hear that song, I would go listen to that person. And I feel like with even with the Aaliyah song, when that came out, you said you wasn't really messing with it that much. Like, you didn't really know. Yeah. Kinda iffy. But I feel like I just don't want afro beats to go in this direction what that rap is going to just stick here and just use a bunch of samples to make music like i feel like one of the things i always liked about afro beats that really drew me into it was like the real instrumentation and it sounded like fresh beats and stuff you wouldn't hear over here so i feel like yeah. this is a good way for him to like get his feet wet into american music like get us listening to him but i definitely hope he doesn't just stick with that like for sure like, I hope that Do the you, whole album isn't. Yeah, I think, well, and that's this is where the line is weird, really interesting, right? Like, I was anti-label for a very long time, right? And then I went to go see Stormzy perform. And when I saw Stormzy perform, bro, and I was like, I was like, yo, if it takes, if this 
if it takes a major label for people everywhere around the world to hear his music, if that's what it takes, then I kind of have to fuck with it in a way. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want them in these fucked up deals. Like, you know what I mean? If they're doing good business, so be it. But I was like, bro, it's a shame that we don't, like, Americans don't listen to Storms. Like, when I was watching that performance, I'm like, yo, this might be the best performance I've ever seen in my entire life. No bullshit. And I was like, I was like, yo, it might take universal for, for somebody in America to see that. It might take universal. And so it definitely is a fine line to where it's like, yo, if every song is a fucking Jeremiah Aaliyah sample and that's where he goes from here on out, they fucking the game. Like I said, major labels are might destroy Afro beats. But if they just give them the visibility and they are occasionally like if this album is that and then he goes on and goes back to doing other shit. I won't be mad at it in the long term. You know what I mean? But I get what you're saying. I 100% agree with you. Like this, the sound can't become sample Americanized heavy. It can't. Like if it does that, then it's like we right back at square one. Right. right. Yeah. So we'll see where this goes. Like I said, I had a couple of things, a couple more things I wanted to talk about before a new music. Did you see the Can't Flog not line up? I did see it. I'm going to pull it up again. I had a picture of it up so I could just see. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a couple of the names up while you uh release it. But I think that the 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 highlight of this was the hillbillies highlighting it. I mean headlining it. I think they have a project coming. I could see I that. I think that I think they have a project coming because they put the song out. The 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 the, 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 the whatever the song is, you know. They put the song out. I fucked with the song, but for them to headline the festival, it's like and they're still calling themselves this group. I think they definitely have music coming out for sure. But the rest of this lineup is crazy. And I think that a lot of these people, Tyler did a good job of finding like very unique people to put on this lineup. Like these are a lot of American artists that I feel like are doing good music right now. You know what I mean? Right. AG Club, Huey, Hughes, Huey's, I don't know how you pronounce that. Paris, Texas, Bombing Tiger, Tizo Touchdown, Bad, Bad, Not Good, Redville, Raven, Lene. Clips, Kevin Abstract, Pink Panthers, Rex, Orange County. I'm just going to put some other highlights. Scissors, the headliner, Tyler, the creator's the headliner. Cal Uchis, Ice Spice is on here. Lil Yachty's on here. Um, what's on here? Double Genesis, Davey Rose, Manal, Maxo. Maxo and Maxo Cream. I didn't know there was another one. Um, I didn't know that either. But yeah, and there's a couple other names I don't know in here. But what did you think about this? I was going to honestly try and get tickets. But by the time I realized the tickets had come out, they were sold out. Yeah. Yeah. I think they started selling tickets a couple of months ago. And I mean, this is probably one of the festivals I'm I'm paying for it next year. Like, I got to see it because he always picks really good artists. I think it's a mix of like a lot of underground artists, some indie artists, like some of the ones in the middle, like Rex Orange County, Dominic Fike. They're more indie Um I know Earl Sweatshirt too. I'm surprised because him and Tyler were really cool for a while, but I did see a picture of like the whole odd future. They were back together a couple of days ago. So they took a picture. Like, so I minus was Frank cool. Ocean. Minus Frank Ocean. You knew who wasn't there. <laughs> we already knew. But um, Willow too. She's um, obviously Willow Smith, but she does kind of like rock um, indie music. So that's kind of different too. But I think this is kind of, I think all these festivals have started becoming reflective of the times. Like I said it about Lala, like Lala had a lot of EDM artists, a lot of dance artists, stuff like that. And I think this is just reflective of like a lot of these like different types of artists are going to be what's popular in hip hop for the next couple of years, just because it's different. It's not the same thing we've been here. It's not the triplet flow. It's not the Migos. I'm trying to do that. It's something different. Like even you started with AG Club. I listened to AG Club a couple of years ago and they're real different. Like they incorporate yeah. a lot of rock stuff into their music and like I think yeah, I think it's gonna be a good festival, bro. For sure. I think I think festivals I think festivals now that they're sort of oversaturated, the only way you're going to be able to stand out is like the curation aspect. Like mm -hmm. this the festival that I went to, this is what I mean day, it's actually a seven day festival. It's called All Points East. And basically they pick a person on each day to curate the day. So the first day was Stormzy and Stormzy picks all the artists that perform that day, right? Mm -hmm. And he has, and I didn't realize, I didn't realize that till I got there, right? Like he has a song with Nux, he has a song with Kehlani. Um, 
Nippa, he doesn't have a song with. And then Lucky Day, he doesn't have a song with. A couple of the other people, he didn't. But the headliners, he, like, really fucked with. So he picked the names that were on there. And I think that was an appeal of the of the festival as well. And so Tyler picking these, I think it makes sense. And I think that's just going to be a trend that we see more of. And I mean, the artist led festivals have been blowing up recently. You got the Dreamville Fest. You got Drake. You got OBO Fest. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got a bunch of them. So I don't think this is something that is new, but I think it's something that's going to be like definitely setting other festivals apart. The last thing I briefly wanted to talk about real quick, bro, I'm going to keep giving Wale rock recognition because he's that nigga. He's that dude, bro. He posted the other day, he posted a picture of his album Shine that came out in 2017. And I just want to read off the names on here that he has features. Lil Wayne... Major Lazer, Wizkid, Dua Lipa, G Easy, J Balvin, Travis Scott, Davido, Olamide, Chris Brown, and then two people I don't know. But the fact that he had in 2017 Davido, Olamide, Travis Scott, J Balvin, Wizkid, and Dua Lipa, who are all really big today, on his album six years ago, I think like, bro, I don't know. Like I look back at Wale's career differently, like. When we talk about like being a fan of the Joe Budden podcast, I feel like they used to bring him up a lot because of his antics when you go on interviews or when you go on Twitter. And I just feel like he was just like, he was doing so much innovative stuff during that time. But because of the way he just like communicated it via Twitter, via interviews, via whatever, that people just started hating and sort of had kind of disregarded, not disregarded his career, but they have kind of put him on the back burner in that way. And I just, I don't know. I don't think I wish it went differently. I just feel like we just need to like really recognize like you have Drake, you got Cole, you got Kendrick, you got Big Sean. Bro, Wale needs to be mentioned more in these MC rapper talk. He's one of my favorite rappers. And I was just like, there's so many instances of him working with an artist and then them blowing up prior or before they got big. And I think he's just lyrically one of the best. And I just briefly wanted to mention that because I just, I don't know. I think this podcast is about highlighting great music. He's been making great music for over a decade. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of hard to give him that credit when you got like the people you said that were around him during that time. How are you going to sit there and compete with a Cole, a Kendrick, a Drake? Uh, Meek Mill was on the same label as him at the same time, blowing up around the same time as him. I feel like, he definitely had like mm, there was too much shine on the other people for him to get that shine that he really should have gotten but Wale has been making great music and I mean I don't even know if he's gonna put out a new album soon but I would love to hear it and just the fact that he was that early on a lot of those artists does show his insight bro I think no hands went diamond it did I could believe that I feel like I heard that in every party no hands went diamond and then he has I'm looking at his uh let me look at his where's it is his platinum records, bro. Yeah, No Hands Went Diamond. Bad his album Bad. Well no, Bad went three times platinum. Lotus Flower Bomb went two times platinum. Ambition is platinum. On Chill is dope, two times platinum. Matrimony is platinum. My PYT platinum. And then he got hella gold gold tracks on here, bro. I understand what you're saying. He was definitely next to a lot of people also being signed to Rick Ross next to Meek Mill. I get what you're saying. But it, he was he was successful as well. You know, I just think I just think the antics put a damper on his career in that way. You know, and I just want to reiterate the fact that he's that nigga. <laughs> I just want to reiterate. Yeah, I just no. want to. It didn't even have to be a long thing. I just want to reiterate that. Right. New music, though. Did you listen to Santiago? I did listen to Santiago. I liked it a lot. I, I feel like every Rush project that's came out, I've messed with it for a certain song. I felt like he was kind of, kind of coming out like on a sad, sad boy type of vibe. Like he was kind of on his like chill thing. But then after a second listen, it felt kind of introspective. And I feel like every time he dropped a slow song into the album, he would definitely put like a hard, just crazy rap track in there after. And I feel like it's not really what you're hearing in the mainstream still is a lot different. It sounds like somebody who is well-traveled and it's just real raps. Like I was really messing with it. 
Yeah, bro. I really fucked with this album. And as a project, as a project, I don't know. There's really a wolf holds a special place in my heart just because of who I am and the journey I'm on. So that project may never be top for me. And that's like when everybody says, like, you have your whole life to make your first album. And right. so I I don't know if it'll I can't really compare them in that way. But what I will say, bro, the state of rap. Me and me and you have talked about this a lot, like in terms of just skill and mastering a skill, right? Like I, t- I used to tell you when I finished that, when I was finished playing basketball, that in the beginning, like when you're getting good, like when I was getting good at ball handling, I pulled every move out the bag. I would work on everything. I would do everything. And then I feel like I had got to a point by the end of college where it was like, you realize less is more and you realize you, you mm. like, Doing all of that, by like culminating all of that work, allows you to become wiser in knowing how to use a skill and how to apply it in certain ways, right? And I feel like part of the reason that rap, I feel like that's the change that rap is going through and the thing that I appreciate about a lot of artists overseas. Like, I always bring up Benson, right? I was talking about this with Joey Atkins. He's one of my favorite artists because he knows when to rap and he knows when to sing melodies and like when to balance them out, right? And I think this project is Russ, like, really honing in on that type of mastery in that way, right? Like he knows like which pro- like enough is a crazy rap record, you know what I'm saying? But it's sandwiched in between songs that maybe aren't as like lyrically heavy. And I think that's just like, like mastering your skill in the way of knowing like, this is how I want to deliver this type of message on this type of track. And I just, I appreciate him realizing that. And it ta- it shows real growth on like knowing that he was the rapper's rapper. He was the rapper's rapper, you know what I mean? And knowing like, yeah. okay, I don't have, just have to bar you down on every song, you know? And this project, yeah, this project is really good and I really fuck with it. Um, I'm going to give it a couple more listens, but I had it downloaded when it came out and I've been listening to it like on the train and walking through. So I fuck with it. Yeah, sounded real good to me, honestly. I, th- I thought there was going to be more of like a, like I said, he sounds well traveled, but I thought there was gonna be more. Maybe he would mix in some Afrobeats artists, some Spanish artists, but I like what I heard from it. So it, it's kind of unnecessary from this album. But I think he's one of those people that's gonna dive into that a little bit. For sure. So second one, before the smoke, unknown T. Did you give this a listen? It's okay if you didn't, but yeah, did I you? did. I listened to all four songs. Um, and all I really want to say is Odu Modu Block might be feature artist of the year. I know this song came out before. Yes. But I hadn't yes. heard it, so Odu Modu Block might be feature artist of the year. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Before the smoke, unknown T. This is interesting to me because he signed to Island Records, which is a subsidiary of Universal. Shout out Universal for grabbing all the black artists. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we love it. But unknown T was somebody I definitely, I definitely mentioned him. I want to say like five or six weeks ago on this pod. And I told you to go listen. And I'm like, something's coming. And these four songs are crazy, bro. And I really fuck with Unknown T. His flow is different. He's really unique. And I think this is a good, like, label debut, if you want to call it that. Welcome to my strip. I agree with you. Olumodu Block, feature artist of the year. Man has not missed. We're in August, and the man has not missed. Drop the project. Drop the project. We in August, he got at least four more months to keep going crazy. So I'm right. Right. Um, Scribs Riley, I've only heard him on a song with Sir, but I've heard he's a pretty good artist. Um, but yeah, I fuck with this song. And then Lan- uh, Lancey, Lancey Fox, I keep seeing his name pop up and he's like very rock esque. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, I didn't fuck with a lot of his music, but this feature was kind of fire. I ain't going to I fuck with it. Yeah. I also found out he's from East London. And I didn't even know because Odin yeah. and Juice had went to one of his first shows in Chicago. Like, I think that was his first show in Chicago. And it was a couple months ago. And I remember them telling me, like, he was real good. Voice sounded crazy. But, yeah, he takes yeah. a lot of that, like, destroy lonely, like, Cardi, that type of vibe for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I'm not going to lie, bro. I might. And it's so crazy because if you remember when fucking, uh, what was that song? In New York, I'm really rock. Oh, yeah. Rock. Magnolia. We were, bro, <laughs> bro, we were obsessed with that fucking song. And then he went on and destroyed rap music. 
Stop, stop. He went on. He went on after that bullshit and destroyed rap music. So I might never forget Playboy Cardi for that, but I fuck with Lindsay. So shout out Unknown T. I just want to mention that briefly. Mick Jenkins, The Patient. I have not listened to this yet, just to preface, but at the end of the Joe Budden podcast, they played the song with Benny the Butcher, and that shit was nuts. So please give me a, a give me the breakdown of this album, bro, because I didn't I've been not Put in respect on Mick Jenkins' name. Not gonna lie. Well, I mean, all I said was that there was a lot of hip hop that came out this year, and I feel like a lot of it's just been like surface level and honestly kind of mid. I feel like it's a lot of cookie cutter stuff you've heard before, and I feel like Mick Jenkins tried to take a little different approach to it. It's definitely one of those albums I would consider like jazz rap. Like he's one of those artists that you're gonna hear a lot of horns, a lot of different just crazy sounds. It doesn't really have sequence. Uh, there was a lot of quotable bars off the wall flows. Like, I feel like he doesn't really sit there and try to stick to one flow the entire song. He's going to say what he got to say. And that's what it is. And I definitely think this type of rap is one of those that's going to stay around. Like you see it from people like I'm going to talk about later, like No Name and um, even Chance the Rapper sometimes, I would say kind of more jazz rap, uh, even IDK. But I think it's really good rap and... If it's something you're looking for new rap songs to listen to to expand your horizons, I would definitely say go check this out. That Benny song is crazy. And then um, I would say my favorite song was probably Roy G. Biv, I believe that one was called. Either that or 007 was crazy too. He had a speaker's knocker, speaker knocker reference in there, and I had forgot he was from Chicago for a second. So Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Good album. That's dope. I'm definitely going to listen to it. I'm definitely going to listen to it just because that song, you know, when you hear one song, you're like, yeah, I got to give it a lesson. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely going to check that out probably this week. Um, no Name by Sundial. I'm not going to lie. It's not like two or three songs off of this. And I'm going to let you jump into the album. But do you hear like the Jay Z Kendrick? Uh, yeah. Get yeah, into the she's... album and then yeah, parlay into that and let me know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I didn't talk about it. it. actually came out last week or the week before, I believe. I didn't talk about it because I hadn't listened to it yet. Like, I wanted to give it me driving down to Florida because I feel like her music, it always takes me a long time to digest. Like, it never has anything to do with the beats, anything to do with the sounds. Like, I feel like her music is real, like, poetic. She's trying to, like, get her message off. And I feel like she's super intelligent, insightful, and she kind of reminds me of somebody, like, uh, Erica Badu even with the way she's just kind of sitting there with the more poetry than rap even though rap is poetry but Rhapsody 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 a Rhapsody, bit too. Rhapsody too I could definitely see that but I remember um I don't remember if it was Snow in the Bluff that J. Cole was talking about her but um he yeah. was sitting there saying how she's one of those people that we need in hip-hop to sit there and educate because she's just like insightful she's that intelligent you could tell that she really her her music is more about a message than anything. And I feel like she isn't afraid also to sit here and take shots at people that she thinks are doing wrong in the industry. She thinks the way they're moving around is kind of shady or whatever. And I feel like maybe you could talk more so about the Kendrick Jay-Z thing. Like I thought it was just Yeah. Let me let me bring up the actual bars, but mm -hmm. I think this is I don't wanna, you know, I like I'm the blackity black guy. I'm not going to lie, bro. I am the blackity black guy. I'm pro black guy. Like, you can kill me if you want. I am him. Like, how much do you work with corporations who don't have black culture in mind? How much do you, like, can you, do you? How much do you interact? Like, what do you do? Right? And so the verse, well, the this was uh, reading between the lines at the crime scene. I ain't fucking with the NFL or Jay-Z propaganda for the military complex. And then the next one, go Rihanna, go. Watch fighter jets fly high. War machine gets glamorized. We play the game to pass the time. Go Beyonce, go. Watch the fighter jet fly high. War machine gets glamorized. We play the game to pass the time. Go Kendrick, go. And it's on. Now, I didn't rap that well. She kind of spent that crazy. That song was crazy. I ain't going to lie. I just kind of read it. So don't come for me there. But, bro, I think... Like the when people talk about like Jay Z's interaction with big business, like especially the NFL, right? Like I I've had a lot of personal opinions about 
professional sports since playing sports like even in the sport bro like playing basketball for so long it's like it is an avenue for black kids but like when like you don't understand the statistic until you become the statistic right like how they used to when you're playing like two percent of people play college basketball and point two percent play professional and point zero 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 two play in the nba and barely in it like you don't understand those and then you think about how much time resources and like attention we gave basketball for a decade right a decade and now think about that and think about other cultures and what their basketball is right like two girls i met last night real cool real like they're one's a nurse and one's a physical therapist but it's like they're african and their parents are like this is what you're doing type of deal you know like and it's interesting because it's like because it is so like it's on front street football and basketball in america a lot of people do push their kids into aau into travel basketball and allow them to spend a ton of time on that and i don't know if i disagree with it because we did it but at the same time, it's like, imagine if we did, uh, did that with like other things that built black communities in a different way, you know? Yeah. I, I just feel like that's a real true statement. Like, I feel like in these other countries, like even I remember when I was watching the, I watched the TikTok trial, like when they were sitting there grilling the guy. And one of the things that you notice is that in China or in some of these other countries, when you pull up their TikTok, the first thing you're going to see is like STEM and like science, technology, math, just stuff that teaches kids versus us. When you look at a phone, it's entertainment. Like, I feel like a yeah. lot of that is pushed into American culture in the first place. So I feel like with black people, exceed, it would not even exceeding, but doing well in those areas, that's where our focus went a lot of times. Like you hear all the time, black people are like, oh, I got to. I got to be a basketball player, make music or sell drugs. Like that's the main thing when there's more out there and there's more avenues for black people to become great and to become wealthy. But it's just like, that's not what we're shown. We see, we see right. athletes, we see music entertainers, we see drug dealers, the pimps, the, like all that stuff. And we're not pushed towards being doctors and being, being on wall street or doing stuff like that. Like, I feel like it's not something that, we put as much importance on when we should when we really should yeah yeah i agree i agree with that and i think that i don't want to like completely like go against all of these artists for doing these things you know what i'm saying because when you have a set of skill when you have a set of skills and i think this is where rihanna and jay-z have sort of excelled it's like they use that avenue to propel them into like other things you know what i mean right and so that they use it as a springboard in that way and so i don't like i'm not against it but i see why people are looking at it kind of funny and it has me thinking like like if you understand advertiser do you know the origin of soap operas have i talked to you about this mm, wasn't it something with like a soap box like a so soap operas were created by soap companies right and so soap operas were like think about like Grey's Anatomy or like show shows that are going on for 10 11 12 13 14 seasons on like like NBC ABC like the real public channels like these shows were created with the intent on selling products around it that's why it's so you know what I'm saying so like people think oh Grey's Anatomy is the money maker like no Grey's Anatomy is the loss leader you know, like they, the Grey's Anatomy, they put that on TV for people. They know people are going to watch it, obviously. But that, that's, that's what you like working in marketing, the attention, the attention grabs, right? If I get a hundred million people to watch this episode, when I put this 30 second clip in there selling ivermectin or fucking, uh, uh, soap detergent, whatever, right? And 1% of people buy that. I just made a million sales. Right. And so we think it. And so, wow, we we're the, and that the crazy part is like, that's why I think like earn your leisure and people like that are so important because it's like you have to shift it where it's like the media isn't bad because the sports games are the soap operas. Right. The NBA games, the NFL games, those are 
the attention. That's when people are watching, right? And we are the people on those, we are the people in the games. But you also have to think like, who owns the channels? Why, why is Jalen Brown getting paid $307 million? Where's the money coming from? It's like, it's the ticket sales, it's the TV deals that they got, the YouTube deals. Like, this is where the money's coming from because they know if they can get X amount of people to watch the game, then we can go sell them this car. We can go sell them this insurance, you know? And so, like, I think it just has to be a shift in mindset where it's like the media, the entertainment isn't the bad thing, right? It's not necessarily bad to watch Rihanna at the halftime show. It's like, we just don't own any NFL teams or the channels that they're on or the products being sold. That's what it is. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, so I think No Name has definitely valid points in this, but I think some of the problems I have with people who do stuff like this is that they don't, and maybe I'm just not well-versed enough on No Name to know if she's really dove deep into these topics outside of, because the thing with rap is like, if you don't do these rap breakdowns, it's like, it's like, how do you, like, what does this mean to somebody that's not doing what we're doing right now? Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's like Rihanna is just performing at the halftime show. What are you mad about? It's like, if we don't have this conversation, me and you, people might not know what this means, you know? So I don't know if she's actually diving into those topics outside of like a musical forum to like explain it to people who might not understand. But there are a lot of people who like, like point, like throw rocks and point and then really don't like help to absolve the issue. And I think that's what J. Cole was saying. Like J. Yeah. Cole was like sort of mad, like, bro, help me understand. Like you can't just be mad at me for doing something and not explain why you're mad at me, yeah. you know? And so like, I think her pointing it out is definitely valid, but I think the big, bigger conversations like me and you are having are important. And I think, um, I think it's just a nuanced point, you know, like that. And this, this is like really the reason I'm in marketing. Like that stuff I'm talking to you about, it's like, the thing between media and the product and the ownership is the marketing. Like I'm the middleman in that way. And that's why I think it's so important what I'm doing. And that's why I'm like, oh, this is what I, this is why I feel like that's what I need to be doing. Cause it's like, that's the disconnect. But, you know, go listen to Sundial. <laughs> go listen to Sundial. But yeah, what, um, while I find a song, what are you doing this week? What are you doing? Um, are you doing anything on campus this week? Like, what's going on? Like, um, when do you guys start? Well, I move in on the 23rd, and then they have a yeah. bunch of welcome week stuff from the 24th until, I believe, the 27th, because then we start on the 28th. Like, I actually start classes. Um, everybody pray for me. I'm hoping I get into my last two classes. They're trying to not give me my credits, and I'm kind of stressing about it, but, you know, we'll figure it out. And... Yeah, I mean, I know specifically there's this one party that I really want to go to on the 25th. So locked into that, but really just moving in, getting myself acclimated. And then as soon as dad leaves, I feel like I'm going to get that moment of like, whoa, like I'm, I'm alone. Like I'm not like, obviously I have my roommates, which crazy thing. All of my roommates are from Chicago. Every single one of them, really? all three. That's cool. Yeah, Do that's you know, cool. Like, did you know them? Did you know them before or are you just meeting them? The the oldest one, because two of them are my, I mean, one of them is my age. The other two are a year like, younger. I had heard of him. Like, I saw him on Instagram, but I didn't really, like, know him for real. But I know of him. And then his brother or his brother's friend, it's, I forget which one it is right now. I got to figure that out. But one of them sells shoes, and Odin said he had heard of that dude, too. So, I mean, kind of, kind of know who they are, just not know them, know them. So it is cool though that I do have people who are from the same place. Oh, so that's dope. Um, okay, my song of the week this week is yo. I saw it when I was in I was in Notting Hill yesterday. I didn't mention this, but I was in Notting Hill yesterday, and I was uh, I went to a record store. And oh wait, I'm about to get at you, niggas. <laughs> I'm about to get at you, niggas. I forgot. I almost forgot. So on my uh, on the podcast, we talked about Fela Kuti and how he learned and how he went to L.A. with the Black Panthers, right? Tell me why I walk in this fucking record store. <laughs> yeah, you niggas, you hear me? And so I didn't know this. The lady he's talking about who was in the Black Panthers, that helps him understand Black nationalism. Her name is Sandra. Uh, what is it? Sandra. Wait, 
Sandra I. I forgot how you pronounce her last name. Let me, let me find it. Oh, Sandra Akande Isidore. I didn't know she made music. This is the vinyl they made together. Fela Kuti, Africa 70, and this lady in the Black Panther Party, Sandra Akande Isidore. Upside down, nigga. So here's proof. <laughs> but anyway, song of the week. Um, I saw a sign for Olami Day's album Unruly yeah, on the wall by the record store. And I was listening to that again. So I'll give y'all uh, She Be Bebe by Olami Day and Fireboy DML. That song is a vibe. Fireboy DML is that dude. I think. I think right now, I don't want to say he's getting under-recognized because Ashake is, like, killing. He just had a sold-out show at O2 last night. He came in on a helicopter. It was nuts. <laughs> um, but Fireboy DML is on a run, too. He's had a couple features this year that I like, so definitely take out that, check out that song, She Be Bebe by Olami Day and Fireboy DML. Well, I talked about the Mick Jenkins album, and I was going to say the Benny the Butcher song. But I would say go listen to Show and Tell with Freddie Gibbs. I really love Freddie Gibbs' verse on there. Um, and just go listen to that album. It's a really good album. And I mean, I'm kind of partial because he's a Chicago native, but great album. Go listen to that Show and Tell by Mick Jenkins and Freddie Gibbs. Well, I just had to. I'm so glad I remembered that so I can get at you niggas, bro. I'm hyped now. I'm hyped. <laughs> but, um, I got another record too. So, yo, if you ever get to a vinyl store, I hope you do, or like a record store, bro. It's interesting. Like, think about, I have to really think about like, you, when you're going record shopping, it's not like Spotify, you just click on it and listen to it. It's like, you know the artist and you know the album, or you have to like, you hope they can play it on the, re like in the record store. And so um, I was, I saw a cover that I really liked. But they didn't, um, he didn't have any more of those in there. So he showed me, he recommended me another one. And basically they found a bunch of songs from a bunch of various artists and they pressed it up. And I was like, oh, like this looks cool. Like it looks dope. It's called, um, it's called, dang, uh, Lagos All Routes. And he basically found a bunch of different African artists from like the seventies and the eighties and he pressed it up. But uh, he was like, I can play it for you. So he put it on the loudspeaker in the, in the, uh, in the record store while I was looking through the record. And it was so dope. Cause I'm like going through stuff and I'm like, bro, I'm going through Jay Dilla vinyl records in <laughs> London. Like it's crazy. I'm going through Fela Kuti records. I'm going, I found KRS boogie down productions, like crazy shit that you would never think you'd see by, by Marley and the Whalers, three pack LPs, like crazy stuff i had so much fun in there that was probably the highlight of my day yesterday but it was i definitely got these are the first two vinyls i got and i think the goal now is to buy vinyls with music you can't find on streaming platform because that it kind of defeats the purpose it's like you can't find these two on streaming platform and so i got this one for 20 pounds and that one for 20 pounds but it was definitely an experience so if you can get to a record store, anybody out there, I would definitely try. It's, it's a fun experience if you love music. But I just wanted to wrap with that because this trip has been very illuminating for me, not just in a music way, but like in a life way. You know what I mean? Traveling solo is so important. I think if you're looking to like really develop and grow as a person, I think you just get so many experiences that you wouldn't get any other way. And I would recommend you and anybody else who can, like, take us, even if it's just go, you know what I'm saying? Like, you go to Atlanta, you go to fucking Virginia, whatever. Go somewhere by yourself. Yeah. I was thinking about going to, because Gainesville, where University of Florida is, I was thinking about going there for, like, a weekend, seeing if I could find something to do. But obviously, I don't have nobody to go out there with. So I was like, maybe I could just do something like that by myself to get myself exposure to it, especially. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, like, like you're going to college, you know what I mean? Like, like you said, you're about to have that moment pretty soon. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you're not alone alone, bro. Like, you're going you're gonna to make friends when you're on campus. You're going to be able to meet people. Like, just just watch that. Go to the yeah. store with dad tomorrow and watch how, how you talk to people. Bro, I was, I was, I was, I was sitting, there at the beach, 
and there was a bunch of foreigners on this beach like probably it was probably the last thing we're going to talk about because my laptop's gonna die but we was on yeah. the beach bunch of foreigners dad was just talking to people randomly about the dog and like i was like you don't know any of these people bro. just any of them. he's just comfortable like it's just being bro, comfortable with it i got 50 this is the last thing i'll say but i got 15 new followers yesterday on instagram just from just chopping it up you know what i'm saying like i, I met this 40 year old couple who's going to take me to carnival next year random as fuck random as fuck but yeah it's not that hard um this was a good episode this week uh i honestly enjoyed it a lot i think we got a lot of content all right y'all um, this was episode 20 niggas can't flip with us right, you know what i'm you. saying you know youtube algorithms gotta watch when you're cussing but we're gonna be back with 21 and we're gonna be in the top 0.1 percent of podcasts in terms of <laughs> episodes put out and i think we're about to we're about to hit our stride i think it's a great episode but we'll see y'all next week